Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining me for this month's webinar for publishing and media around personalization. So the title of this month is Personalization, How Much is Too Much? And um, my name is Brett Kierstead. I'm Vice President of Sales for Knowledge Marketing, and I'm excited to spend about 40 minutes with you today on hopefully what you'll find to be a you know, kind of a different and fun look at this subject. Uh, just a little bit, for those of you who are new, we do um, uh, record today's session, so for others that may be interested, pass it along, you can do so. We will send follow-up information to you on a very personalized basis, I'm sure. And uh, if you have questions for me along the way, please submit them through GoToMeeting and uh, we'll get right to it. But uh, just a little bit about knowledge marketing for those of you who are new. Um, our focus is on providing technologies and services and strategies for publishing and media. Um, again, our goals are to help publishers looking to unify their, their audiences that are looking to re-energize how they do email and the different content distribution there. Uh, modernizing the process of circulation management. We're helping them capture a lot of the behavioral engagement and, and user information that we're going to talk about today, um, as well as really helping drive forward media success, sales success. So a lot going on in our industry. Obviously, by the fact you're on here today, you're looking to learn new ideas, and uh, hopefully we can hit the mark. We have a lot of customers that we draw our interest and our information from. So um, yes, again, while I'm talking, I assure you, a lot of the stories and examples that we get are from our customers that are doing some very successful things in this area, that are really looking at different ways uh, of improving their business. My goal for you today, um, why I hope you get out of this, meaning you personally, is I want to provide you with uh, a unique perspective and an evaluation lens for your own personalization strategy. Um, you know, personalization, as you'll see, is kind of a buzzword. It's on the long list of fun things that marketing people like to pick up and industry folks as the strategy du jour. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting things in here. Many things are being done outside of what we might con consider traditional publishing. Um, but my goal in these webinars is always to give you maybe a different way of thinking about things other people are doing and try to apply them to the way that you're making decisions about your own business. Okay, so I'm going to start with a poll, just a little bit about personalization. And it really, it goes like this. Personalization, you know, as a strategy, when you are back at your business, do you guys talk about it? So A would be, yeah, personalization is a major theme for our business and we always are thinking about specific strategies on how to do it. The second one might be, you know, people are talking about it in our business and we know we need to do it, but it's unclear how. And the third one is, is nobody really talks about it, but I'm on here because I'm interested. So if you just take about a few seconds to answer it, we'll, uh, we'll go from there. So I'll give you about uh, another five seconds to just put your answer in and we'll be good. Okay, so let's see, I can share this. Hopefully you can see it. Basically it says that, you know, I'll just take it as the first two, the top one, 25% of you have said that is a very specific goal in your business and more importantly, you also have some strategies around it. The bulk is in the middle, 58%. Recognize as a business where a lot of folks are these days where they're hearing about it and they know that there's things that they need to do but it's unclear exactly what it is. And the last one is, is really some self-discovery. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you are excited about it and interested to learn, but it sounds like your company isn't really thinking about it strategically. So we have a nice mix, and um, hopefully we can use that as a uh, building block for the rest of today. Okay. So every there is a lot of talk about it. You know, a lot of people are writing ads about it, writing articles talking about it, personalization this, personalization that. So it's definitely out there, and why people are doing it in publishing and media is for a few specific reasons. You know, number one is that there's competition for the reader's attention um, as well as for advertising dollars. You know, there's different places for people to um, spend their money, <laughs> you know, or, and uh, we certainly want to get more of it, and personalization seems to be driving a lot of those initiatives. Obviously, there's list fatigue. We certainly want to make sure that we're sending the right content to people, and so personalizing them seems to be an improvement. I think there's a lot of talk around the degrading of the website experience, and we'll show you a little bit about what I think bad personalization is doing to that. 
We'll talk a little bit about lead quality. Again, leads, generic leads um, are one thing, but I think advertisers are looking for something a little bit more detailed, more personalized, just not clicks anymore, uh, or impressions. They're looking for something a little bit more specific. There's threats and opportunities from technologies that are making personalization both easier as well as potentially a threat to how well you can do it or what you need to be doing there. And lastly, we're personalizing a lot of what we're doing because we're getting pressure from under it, other industries, which we'll talk about. Interestingly, a survey was done, so consistent with our survey, they just asked somebody, a uh, website magazine asked the question, you know, is personalization key to success? 98% said yes. However, 4% of their marketers described their websites as very personalized. So similar with our study, you know, there's a lot of interest, um, but still a lot of work that needs to be done in this area. My goal with these webinars, and again for today, is those of you guys who attend and you're the regulars that show up, I hope you know that we try to think things a little bit differently. There's a lot of really good ideas even outside of publishing and media, and my theme for the day, for those of you who may have read this book, is Think Like a Freak. It's just a different perspective on some non-traditional considerations to traditional issues. So my theme for the day is that we, uh, you know, we kind of think a little bit differently. We I know we're all multitasking right now, but hopefully you'll kind of focus on just a couple of different ways of thinking about this traditional issue. So let's define it, you know, and I think this is a good one for you guys to understand because sometimes we just think of personalization in an overarching manner, and it, it really isn't indicative of the different choices that you have. Wikipedia, which, you know, again, is one way to look at it, has some interesting perspectives, and I think it's a good one that we'll use today. One version of personalization is implicit. So implicit personalization is something that goes like, it's learned from interactions with the user. So we'll show you some examples, but you know, if I click on a certain article, then it's implicit, we're implying as the publisher as, that you're probably interested in something else like it. You, know, you click on something about football and it's probably you're gonna be interested in fantasy football or something like that, right? So it's implicit personalization. Explicit, says, I, I explicitly tell you, I, I personally explain to you that I want something personalized according to my standards. Okay, and then hybrid would be both. So explicit says, show me articles about X. I'm telling you what I want. Versus implicit, which is implying by some other behavior. So again, there's are different ways to think about personalization. We don't all have to fit in one bucket, but it's good to understand. The last one is funny, but ironic. It's called mass personalization, which actually seems counterintuitive to the word personal, that there's lots of it, but we do tend to think of it this way of saying, you know, for a thousands of people that do the same thing or look the same, let's send them something based on that criteria that is personalized, but really there's a thousand other people like them. So that's a word that you hear a lot about mass personalization. All of these are acceptable ways to think about it strategically. I just want to make sure that we're not just lumping it into one bucket. Other names that we see in our industry, customization, retargeting, marketing automation, responsive design, all these are components of technologies, of things that get intermingled that imply that there's some kind of dynamic force that's changing the content or the experience of the reader or audience member based on some distinguishing factor so that every single person doesn't have exactly the same experience. There's some criteria that distinguishes between one user and another. Okay? So I, uh, I started my sales career a long time ago, um, and it's funny that personalization back in the old days was cheaper, right? Because you'd write a handwritten letter or handwritten note. It was very inexpensive. But mass marketing was very expensive, right? Billboards, radio ads, TV was inexpensive compared to a personalized message. In today, it's really exactly the opposite. It's cheap on a relative scale in terms of time and effort to blast the world with everything you want, and it's more expensive to do things that are personalized in terms of production costs, in terms of your time, in terms of your effort. So, even in my professional career, I've kind of flip-flopped the way these are played out. And today, when you think about personalization, there's a lot more to think about. You have to think about who's the recipient and what kind of content topics are they interested in or what kind of a device might they have it in. Is there a certain style? Do you want to customize the offers that you have if it's a lead program? Is this a B2B program or a B2C? 
is there consent? We have to think about consent when we determine personalization. Privacy, what about that? You know, what is the desired action? We don't, everybody that we send an email to, let's say as an offer, we want a different desired action from them. Maybe someone's to register, one's to renew, one's to enroll. You know, there's all these different considerations, including the last one, which is the size of the opportunity. Are you selling somebody something for a dollar or something for 10 million? Right, so all of these are considerations when you think about the level of personalization that you want to take. When we think about a definition, this is a famous uh, court case, many of you say it, and that's a good way to think about personalization. It's called, I know it when I see it, which is I don't necessarily have a crisp definition of personalization, but I can tell you I know it when I see it, or I know it when it's good or not good. Okay, So we'll use that a little bit in these examples. So here's something a lot of you get. We get these emails that will say, Dear Brett, you know, have you done blah, blah, blah as a professional, you know, in the direct marketing world, do you want to do this, right? So it's clear that parts of this, including my name, make it personal, but do I really think that this is personal to me, okay? I mean, it's added in, it's fun, I get it, but again, do you ask yourself, do I really feel like I'm getting something special in here or just something that was put into an algorithm, okay? How about this is personal? We all love to hear our name. It's the, it's the favorite word everybody likes in the English language is their own name. But you know what? And that's personal when it says it, but if you do it too much or you're cheesy about it, that's personalization that goes wrong, right? Brett, is safety important to you and your family, right? I mean, we hear that all the time personally, but are we asking ourselves, is that really a good use case? You got this invite to this webinar. Do you wonder if it was personalized to you? Did we do something on here when you got it that's different from the next person that caused you to attend this webinar? Had we done it differently, would you have not attended? Right? So those are another question about personalization. You know, clearly my shoe, my son's shoes, you know, he goes out and he orders these personalized. They're very expensive, so he pays for personalization. Right? We know that those are personalized to him. He chose them. But when you went on our website or you registered, was that personal? Again, the question is, is delineating between what is personal to you, what feels like it's done that way, what is explicitly personal, and how do you marry them in a publishing world to make me feel like I have a unique experience without it being cheesy, okay? You know, so other media, direct TV is an example, you can choose the way you want and personalize the types of experiences that you have. And lastly, this funny cartoon that we've shown before, which would be the ultimate in individual personalization, right? So imagine in a mass market world of banners or, or, or ads, you could get down to this level of personalization, right? So all of these examples of really, truly, one form or another personalization. But I'll ask you guys to think of it this way, the rest of the webinar, as you go back and think of your strategy. And that is the differentiation between what is truly personalization versus what I'm calling peopleization, okay? Personalization really is me. My son, Eli, ordered those shoes for him. No one else has them, okay? Peopleization is an example where we say, look, everybody that meets this definitive criteria, they click on this article, they're interested in this topic, they have this title, they are this person, everybody that fits that personalized category we'll send them something that's custom and unique. Okay, so it's a special offer, but it's really not person in the one sense, it's people. Both are equally effective, guys, but I just want to make sure that when you're thinking about your strategy, you're not lumping all interactions and everything into one bucket. Okay, so it's a good way to think about these different definitions. So I look at it this way. How about we call it this? For you, when you think about your strategy, ask yourself this question. In all the ways that you engage your audience, are you using all the data available to create a unique user content experience for as small of a group of appropriate like individuals as commercially reasonable? Right? It's just not commercially reasonable if you have 100,000 people in your audience to send 100,000 versions of your newsletter. Right? But it is commercially reasonable for you to maybe divide it up into a couple of different groups based on experiences and behaviors and send them three versions of it. Okay, so commercially reasonable is also an important consideration because you don't have unlimited money to break 
a million different versions of everything you do. As a good rule of thumb, we kind of think of it this way. The higher the transactional importance, whether it's in terms of dollar value, investment, or strategy, the more personalization required. I kind of put it in the slang world. You know, for people going into McDonald's to order a hamburger or whatever, it doesn't need to be that great of a personalized experience. You want it to be consistent and easy and similar and repeatable and quality of an experience, but it doesn't need to be highly personalized because it's a transactional experience. Conversely, on the right, someone selling a $10 million mega mansion really wants to make sure that that experience with that content, right, the ad, the offer, whatever it might be, is highly, highly personal. Because in this case, they might be making, like you said, a $10 million investment. So again, remember, there's always a commercial impact on what you're doing. Um, if you're getting someone to convert to a webinar versus you're getting that's free versus you're getting someone to go to a conference that has a $1,500 registration fee, you shouldn't be treating personalization the same because the investment that the person's making is significantly different. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about data. So data is important. You have data. Publishers have a unique database. They have tons of information across various different channels about how their audience interacts. You know, we call it demographic data, which many of you have collected from, from qual cards, from traditional print sources, from all these different areas. You have behavioral information that you're tracking with email opens and clicks and website visits and event attendance, webinar registration, all this fun stuff. And then lastly, the emerging area is topical content tracking. Many publishers are using their content management system to track articles of interest, topics of interest. All of these pieces of data come together to create for you the foundation to provide useful personalization. You also want to make sure, just as an advice, uh, a good rule of thumb, the more people are confident that you're protecting their data, the more willing they're to, to provide you data, and therefore statistically more comfortable allowing you to use that data to personalize. There's a group called Gigia. They have a, some good content on their site that just talks about some studies and philosophies on this that just says, look, if I knowingly tell you that I'm interested in the Minnesota Vikings, I knowing you tell me that, you protect that information, and you send me information about them, I'm more comfortable with that in general because you've maintained the protect and protected the integrity of my data. Okay, so it's important to make sure that you're visibly out front about the protection of their information. You know, progressive registration, another personalized data experience. This is popping up in this area of asking more and more questions about people. So again, each time someone comes to a website, you're customizing that experience to ask them additional information. You know, when it comes to data, consent is important. We'll just talk a little bit about this later as well. But determining in legal terms as well as just in ethical terms or strategic terms, what, how important is consent? What kind of information do you feel you really need consent to use for any kind of marketing initiative? So again, when it comes to consent, always, you know, we'll talk a little bit about this later, it's important to consider when it comes to using data. Lastly, technology is emerging. Um, I, this is very hot in the news right now, this whole ad blocker, um, Google, uh, initiative about installing software that allows for ad blocking. You know, this this quote, this article that just came out, I think a couple days ago, specifically was about is this forcing, is ad blocking technology forcing publishers to change their strategies on how they play ad content? And if so, what does that mean? You know, is, are people going to have a more explicit opt out or going to really challenge you on the relevancy of your ads and content? And if it's not good, it's really easy for them to block it. So again, I think this is an emerging area, but clearly one that when it comes to site personalization for ads, you better be paying attention to it because you could find yourself stuck um, with people that are blocking your ads because they're irrelevant. Okay, so that's the foundational stuff. I think we kind of understand that. Let's get to some ideas that maybe you can uh, sink your teeth into. So, okay, here's a fun one. Again, ask yourself, whenever I present these examples, guys, I ask yourself, Number one, how can we learn from this? Number two, do we do anything this right or this dumb? Um, and number three, what is applicable to our business? So many people believe that Amazon were the kings of recommendation engines and personalization, especially in an online world for shopping. Those of you who remember the recommendation box, the gold box, you know, they are very known for that. Well, 
here's a question that I would ask you if you've experienced this. And again, guys, think of this on your own site. We all want recommendation engines and personalization. Okay? I was on Amazon. I told you guys I bought this book. I logged in at home. I was out there leaving my information for Amazon. Okay? My daughter came over and she said, hey, Dad, does Amazon sell bathing suits? She goes, we're going on vacation and I want a bathing suit. I'm like, sure, honey. So she uses my login, right? She's in my session, logs in and is looking at bathing suits, right? So next time, two days later, my wife logs into my system for Amazon and she sees the following, right? She sees recommendations from Amazon based on my behavior, what I was looking at from what they believe was me because I logged in that it made recommendations of these things. So what is my wife going to ask me? Hey, honey, what are you looking at, right? And again, is it, it is implicit because I looked at other things last time that these are things that I would want, but is it really what I want or is it really appropriate to the person actually logging in? Now, again, I know that's an example of a shared login, which is a little bit goofy, but if you just play it out and think to yourself, Am I really making the appropriate recommendations? Do I really know about that individual when I'm looking at it implicitly, like the same person is logging in or the same person with the same interests is there? So again, I'm not saying that these are inappropriate based on my behavior. I'm just saying that they're not really all of the things that I want implicit for the next time I purchase. One of the things that Amazon does, and maybe it's something you guys can consider, is what they call hybrid consent. You can go into Amazon and click on their recommendation engine, and it allows you to look at everything you've ever seen and determine on the right-hand side, as an example, to say, this was something I don't want to use for future recommendations. So what I might do is to go in and click the bathing suit and say, don't use that for any other recommendations from a content perspective, because I don't really care. I like that you're recommending things like you know, the lectures on literature book, but I don't like that you're recommending things to me based on a bathing suit. So I think that that's a nice example of both implicit and explicit consent that might be useful to you so you don't get yourself into trouble recommending things that people really don't want. You know, another example is Match.com. I mean, I think, you know, we understand Match.com, the, the logic behind it, but again, if you think about it, in a publisher world, in the context of lead gen, or if you think about it in terms of ads, really somebody is selecting based on personalization explicitly what is it that they want to see. And if a person is content, right, a date or what have you that I'm interested in, if that's content, if you just use your brain for a second and kind of correlate the two, you could say, gosh, that's a good experience because I can figure the types of content that I want to see. So again, that's an explicit personalization experience that somebody like a match.com does, which again, I think we should think about the applicability within publishing. In case you're wondering about implicit, which a lot of us do, right? Think about how many of your initiatives you're like, okay, for everybody that does this, we're going to assume they want this, or everybody that does this recommendation or what have you. Well, if you want to go look it up on how hard that is, Netflix a few years ago offered a million dollars as the top prize for any human being that could come up with a recommendation or customization engine of movies better than their own algorithm. And the fact of the matter is with tons and tons and tons of people that thought they could beat the system, there was the best case scenario was a 10% improvement, which again, you might say, well, that's a good 10%, but the amount of effort and intelligence and skill that people came up with to just simply outsmart basic algorithmic personalization was incredibly high. So again, we always have to ask ourselves, are we being, we think we're being smarter than we are in a very complex world of predicting behavior and then therefore predicting personalization based on past interests. So again, I would just tell you to be careful with it. Be careful to go too far thinking you're so smart uh, because it is a very complex science when you're doing implicit uh, interests for personalization. Last thing I'll tell you why I don't like implicit all the time, and I swear to you that I'm giving you a warning about this content, but this is the truth, which makes me think, what's going on, okay? As I was preparing for the webinar, I was listening to Pandora, and I was on Jake Owen Radio. I was listening to country music, 
And they played an ad for me, again, an implicit ad, I assume, because I didn't ask for it, in this case about uh, aspirin from the University of Minnesota. I live in Minnesota. I'm a 46-year-old male. I'm listening to country music. They decided, somebody decided, some algorithm to play me this implicit ad. The second thing that came up after a few songs was Remax. Okay, so you know they're thinking either one based on information I provided them that I want an offer for real estate, or maybe I had browsing history. Well, if you're any bit smart, you know what the next ad's about. Given I told you I was a 46-year-old male in Minnesota listening to country music, was they decided to play me the Cialis ad. Okay, so now again they're implicitly assuming they're personalizing my web experience here and I know that they're doing it implicitly because they had something for Minnesota right there's no reason why they would play an ad for the University of Minnesota unless I lived in Minnesota so they clearly have algorithms that are trying to personalize this experience for me based on implicit interests but this is not appropriate for me it's not a, I, I don't have an interest it's not something I've expressed so again I ask the question of is implicit improving my personal experience or not okay one last thing that we do see a lot of explicitly I know I'm mixing words here but I like a lot of publishers are taking control of this a little bit through subscription management pages you know as an example of allowing your end users to control the way they get your content whether it's their e-newsletters whether it's their magazines whether it's advertising messages I think explicit personalization for the user experience in our industry is being moved out through these kinds of technologies like subscription management which I think is great so again you want your strategy to be a combination of explicit careful implicit and uh, ways to get people engaged with you in different ways okay let's move on to ads and leads I'm gonna ask you another question here I assume most of you if you're in marketing or media understand the famous target paradox you know, the target paradox is as follows. Target used a bunch of data mining and started sending advertising to a teenage girl who, based on her browsing history, they assumed she was pregnant. Okay? They sent a bunch of stuff. The father got mad, uh, called Target, was upset. The girl admitted she was pregnant. Okay? So Target used personalization and data to send very specific offers that were actually appropriate based on her status, maybe not her age, but her status, that were appropriate based on how you might send content. So here's my poll question for you. My poll question for you is follows. Number one, this was an example of, awesome example of how data can drive personalization, right? Our target was perfectly fine. Or number two, target acted inappropriate or potentially unethical okay so I'll give you a few seconds to answer that doozy wow fascinating results we'll give you five more seconds all right see if you can guess 63% of you thought it was perfectly fine, that that is a good use of personalization. In other words, they did exactly the right thing. 37% of you thought it was inappropriate, which is interesting to me. It tells me a couple things. Number one is that as a group, as an industry, we don't have consensus. Right? There's not quite an agreement there among even the people on this phone of what happened here. Clearly, the data side of it worked. It matched it up appropriately. And as a marketer, that's our job. You know, our job is not to, to do that. But on the other side of personalization, again, whether it was the Cialis ad before or this, is it offensive to the recipient to the point where it's detrimental to the overall result? So again, I, don't, I obviously don't think there's a right, wrong or answer. You know, Obviously, legally, there's nothing illegal that's happened here. Uh, enough of us believe, I believe, that I think the target was doing the right thing. I don't think that there was anything inappropriate. They didn't sign offensive material. Um, they said, sent reasonable material. So I, I think that they did the right thing. Um, but anyway, again, it's interesting to see that different people can disagree. So let's talk about a little bit more about some of that. As you guys know, again, we talk a little bit about what's going on outside the industry so that you can get a, 
an idea of what your advertisers might be buying elsewhere. You know, Facebook, obviously, the social media allows for a lot of audience targeting. So again, now we're in the ad world. We're talking about personalization of ads based on some criteria. They allow these filters. You can based on location, demographic, interest. Again, guys, all the stuff that you have already, some of you may not be using it, but just so you know, other people are out there pitching this idea to advertisers that they can do this kind of targeting. Behaviors, connections, Facebook even has something called audiences and lookalikes, so give us the characteristics and we'll tell you the audiences that look like that. Twitter now, if you're, Twitter's new advertising, you know, they have a similar model where they allow you to do some various different configurations of the way your ads and content is displayed. Again, think of this for your advertisers when you're thinking about your own content um, to make sure that you uh, are getting exactly the right information. Okay, so here's a good example. Another question I will ask you, going back to this advertising, right or wrong. Here's my Facebook page. Okay, so I go out on Facebook. We all that are on Facebook always wonder to ourselves, what the heck happened? How come these ads show up? So I was looking at a, I looking back at comments that people made on a post I had about my daughter, and over on the right, I'm like. Why do I have an ad for Green Lantern shirt and these weird pants that look like Zumbas? You know, it's like what I know that they're personalizing that for me, but it kind of bothers me that it really isn't relevant. Except that I wonder how did they think that this was what I would want? So again, you have to remember what's going on. These interesting techniques that are happening out there is happening to us, and it needs to be something you consider for your own users. Okay, a couple more things here. Let's look at website. I, I can't stand this, and this is where I say that there's a degradation of the content that a lot of publishers provide, and again, I'll use publishers in the broad sense of anyone that has a media site with content. So here's an example where, you know, here's an article, Real Clear Politics, and I got that cookie because I was looking at Delta flights for a trip to Chicago, and so look, at, and I looked at hotels, and look at the way my page looks now. This is clearly personalized to me because I'm a Marriott person. I was looking at trips to Florida and I was booked on a flight to Chicago. This is absolutely dead on personalized to me. But it's so completely cluttered and inappropriate based on the nature of the article and what I'm trying to do while I'm here. Okay, so again, we really want to be careful that we're watching when we're, especially ads when we're playing, that there's some level of relevancy to the content that I'm looking at. A better version that I see among a lot of publishers that are trying to push in this area is using your content management system, whether it's Drupal, WordPress, Joomla, whatever you have as a content management system, and using the data and information in there uh, on individual profiles that closely align with that end user experience. So again, here's a guy's profile. We know all this stuff about him. Maybe we're somebody that's selling faucets or, or hardware for homes. And we can hone in on this individual and all of their profile information, and we're kind of using this implicit that says, if he meets all of these six or seven criteria, it's probably more appropriate, based on the content, to say we're personalizing, in this case, the ad experience to be something that we find more relevant to the guy. Okay, so yes, we're still making Im implicit personalization. It's not as personalized as the Delta ad was, but it's more relevant to the content and its profile uh, than, than that basically takeover ad because I cookied some site. So again, I just want to make sure that you guys are using today's technology for content marketing systems and personalization to do something useful. You know, because typically we're seeing reasonably that if you can identify a person on a website by name and preference, you have the right to charge a higher rate. Just like Nike has a right to charge a higher price for my son's sneakers when he puts his number and his name on it, so too do you to charge a higher price for personalization within this particular medium. Okay, another example of one that I hope you guys are thinking about for yourselves, I love ESPN, okay? Here's an interesting thing about ESPN. If you, if you don't use ESPN, even if you don't like sports, if you're a marketer, go out and check it out because I think it's an interesting thing that you could think about for your own content personalization. If you go out to ESPN, on the left-hand side, the new version, probably the last few months, they have this section called favorites. Okay, so here on the left-hand side are favorites. So when I come, I see the general page in the middle. 
Okay, but then I also have this little section on the right that I've been able to personalize to me to get what I want. So again, if you think about your own industry, if you're in farming or plumbing or whatever you're in, the end user is coming to your site to understand content. And most likely, if they're a repeater, they come back for some subset of your niche. If you're a construction site, every article in construction may not be relevant, but everything about maybe windows or safety or something like that would be relevant. So if there's a mechanism for me to configure my content experience, it's great. So ESPN does it by saying, I pick the teams that I find most interesting. The Vikings, Clemson where I went to college, Yankees where I grew up, Twins where I live, Wild where I live, and my fantasy football team. Right? So this is my personalization explicitly of what I want to see that improves my personal experience. Now ESPN can make some other assumptions that I might want, but at least I know front and center I've got what I want. Okay, last five minutes, here's another one I hope you guys aren't doing. Okay, this is called the world of automation or marketing automation today. So Kara, who runs our marketing group, forwarded a couple emails to me and it goes as follows. So we're a GoToMeeting customer and we got an email from Citrix. You know, they're the account owners of this group. And they say, hey, hi Kara, personalized, blah, 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 blah. Here's this great offer for new customers that come on board. Okay, nice little template email. Kara, being the smart Alex she is, responds back and says, hey Chuck, great, but by the way, we're already a customer. I'm guessing this was an automated email. His answer, yes, yes it was, sorry for the email blast. Okay, so in our rush to use these little personalizations or try and get people in these automation campaigns and try and do these fun little things, we really gotta ask ourselves, sometimes are we outsmarting ourselves or are we being too cute for our own good? Here's another example. A lot of you, again, are in marketing automation. You're trying to do these cutesy little, if they do this, then they do that. Send them this, send them that in sequence. But I warn you to be careful, OK? Again, Kara was out on this site, results.com. Click to download. Two minutes later, thank you for signing up for our newsletter. You can get it here. Here's my cool picture. And here's me you know, creating this experience. 1037, 1038, one minute later, hey, Kara, I'm so thrilled, Kara that you're interested in this. Here's my picture again. I'm Joseph. Cheers, you know. 12.26, an hour left later. Hey, Kara, I just want to follow up with you on that email, on the other email, on the download to see if you're interested. And so our inbox looks something like this in about an hour and a half, trying to create this hand-holding personal experience for Kara. But again, I ask yourself, is that enough? I mean, it's enough already. You know, I don't want to feel, I want to distinguish between feeling as if I'm in an automated campaign that is clearly force feeding something that feels personal to truly personal. I don't have all the answers for this. It goes back to what I said before. You kind of know it when you see it. I know, you know, we kind of know that this was an automated, impersonal system trying to impart something personal to it. Um, and really you want to try to avoid that especially when it potentially becomes something that is a very, very expensive or high-touch thing to buy. Okay, so guys, here's my summary. Hopefully this was useful to you. Here's what you need to think about. Number one, just remember, personalization, don't step back a little bit from the buzzwords and just ask yourself, across all the various different ways we engage people, what is the experience that they have and is it a commercially appropriate um, for that level of personalization? Second thing is, don't confuse personal with people. There are times for very personal. If you're doing a lead program and it's a $10 million purchase and you're getting to the CIO of a major hospital for an advertiser, that needs to be intimately personal. Okay, but if it's a signing up for a free webinar across 100,000 people, you really need to ask yourself, is it worth a high degree of personalization for that transaction? Personal versus people. Certainly we might want to break it down, but certainly we don't want to get to just one person. Again, understand when an implicit is appropriate versus explicit. If you're worried about the offensiveness or nature of the content, make sure it's explicitly asked for. As a general rule, if you're sending something that is not offensive, you probably have a little bit more of a right to be implicit, but just be careful. Third, commercial reasonable. Every, every executive, yeah, personal, 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 but it always comes at a cost. It's cheaper, as we said before, to send out lots of email as an example. It's more expensive in terms of time and effort to break 100,000 names into 10 groups of 10, 
but it has to be com commercially reasonable to do it. You want to see a differentiated performance of that spend. And lastly, please, 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 always check to see what is the actual user experience by what you're doing. We're all busy. I always think how many times publishers and media companies are rushing to get things out, rushing to get ads on the website, rushing to get emails out the door, and never really following through the full cycle of, did this feel to me like it was a high quality experience? Again, so hopefully you'll take that away. Those of you who are out and about, here's an exciting new thing. My closing here, um, one of the, we just launched in partnership with uh, NAPCO uh, Pub Exec, a media tr sales training program. I've said before, we're all very passionate about improving media sales, and there's a, uh, a camp, uh, a day-long workshop in New York in a couple of months called uh, Reboot, Radically Transforming Media Sales. And for those of you interested, go check it out. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool concept because we all know media sales is changing, and um, we're trying to help lead that transition. Also, if you're out and about, come see us at all the big shows. It's Showtime, BIMS, Folio, the AAMP Conference out west, the Niche Digital Conference in Savannah. You know, again, we hope to see you guys out there. And again, good luck to everybody. Hopefully, it's been a good use of your time. If you have any more questions, drop me a line, and uh, we'll see you guys all again next month. Okay? Take care, guys. See you soon.